Y'all ready to go today? Awesome. Let's go there. Glory. I just want to, I have so much. I think I have so much (laughs) that I have so much. I'm a holy mess. So you better stretch out your hands towards me and your faith and just pray, Holy Ghost, help him. (laughs) Help him, help him, Holy Ghost. To, to pour it out efficiently, effectively, and according to your will. Holy Ghost, help our pastor, or just supersede, transcend him, and blow him up. Amen. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things Perry Ann mentioned uh, that she kicked off this series, Rating the Future, uh, a couple weeks ago, and it's been a bit of a point of a ref, point of reference, and that is that the familiar is the enemy to our future. So I just have a quick question for you: Who or what are you most familiar with? Try to look inside and go cross-eyed, like. Aren't we all most familiar with ourself? Yes. We know what we think more than anybody else knows what we think. I just want to say our worst enemy is our perception of ourself yeah. right. independent from God. The good news for you today is you are no longer independent from him, so it's not that same old self that you've been criticizing and disqualifying. Hallelujah. My Bible tells me in Colossians chapter 1 that he has qualified you to be partakers of the divine nature. Hallelujah. So he made us worthy. You didn't make you worthy, you'll never make you worthy, but he made you worthy already, and you've become, when you're born again, a a partaker of the divine nature. The greater one has moved inside and taken up residence on the inside, and you did not earn his presence, hallelujah, and he doesn't abandon you even when you're imperfect. He fills up your imperfections. Hallelujah. So you and I, we need to get familiar with the new man. Ephesians says, put off the old man and put on the new man, which is renewed in righteousness. So we've got to get to know our new man and become familiar with the new man that the new man is not the enemy of the future. The new man holds our future. So, how many of you know what today is? What, anybody know what today is as a holiday? It's, it's your anniversary. Awesome. Which fell on Pentecost today. Fire. 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 Hallelujah. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is 50 days after Passover. That's where... It, gets its name Penta Cost, which stands for 50. And so in Acts chapter 1, and, and you can go there now, we're going to pick up in verse 6 in a moment. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, Luke writing Acts, which many think, and I agree, that the book of Acts is a continuation of the gospel of Luke. And so he opens it up in verse 1, and he says, I wrote to you before about what Jesus began to do and to teach. And so this is the continuation of what Jesus began when he was baptized with the Holy Spirit himself in the River Jordan when he came to John, who was of a priestly lineage. Remember, John's dad was Zechariah, was served as the high priest. So John served in the role of the high priest, and he ordained Jesus for the ministry. Y'all did catch that. 
That's an amazing thought right there. So that's why Jesus said, this must be done to fulfill all righteousness. He was ordained into the priestly ministry by the high priest, by John, who was of the order of the priestly ministry. So he's writing, and so it goes on to say that Jesus spent 40 days after his resurrection. He showed himself to the apostles with many infallible proofs, and he spent 40 days with them teaching them about the kingdom of God. Post-resurrection, they had a greater capacity to receive what he was trying to tell them before. And so he was teaching them about the kingdom of God, and he did that for 40 days before he ascended for his, I won't say final, but he ascended to heaven, okay? And then... He will return physically, okay, to establish the fullness of the kingdom on the earth. And so, we're going to pick up in verse 6 about in the conversation between the apostles and Jesus. And remember, we are rating the future. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So, when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Or restore the kingdom to Israel. Okay, pause. Do you think they're still in the natural? He just spent 40 days with them talking to them about the kingdom. And they're hearing everything he's saying about the kingdom through the grid of their natural mind and their perception of their interpretation of prophecy that... Israel will be restored governmentally to a nation that is in power and kick the Romans out. So they're thinking politically and naturally. That's the sign that they're looking for. And these are the apostles. These aren't even the Pharisees. These are the ones that spent time with Jesus for three years. So if they're struggling, how many of you think that that was a challenge? So, they're looking for the right time. Is this the time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied to them, in the natural, you could think he's not answering them. But I believe he is giving them the exact answer to their exact question. He's not changing the subject. So let's follow along. I know you're probably reading ahead of me, aren't you? It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Did he say he's not restoring the kingdom? He did not say that. Hallelujah. Listen, he says it's not for you to know times and seasons. And the words there for times and seasons, it's two Greek words, chronos and kairos. Chronos is what is used to describe time linearly, like a chronology of time. It is a time line. It's what all the charts are made out of. How many of you have seen Christian charts? about when Jesus came, when Jesus is coming again, and everything that's going to happen between here and there, right? I just want to encourage you today, burn it. (laughs) Just put it in a trash pile, burn it. Wrap it around a log and burn it. Jesus is saying, it's not for you to figure out the charts and the timeline. It's not for you to look into some designated future, the chronos or the kairos. The kairos, which is translated season here, is not a long period of time. The kairos is a strategic moment in time. It's an intersection in time when heaven and the will of heaven enters into the chronos natural world and and establishes God's will where heaven is done on earth. That is a kairos moment. It is strategic moment. 
moment of opportunity. And so it's using it here. He's saying it's not for you to figure out on a timeline for, for you to know exactly what's going to happen when so that you can be prepared for it. So it's, let me, let's just make this a little more personal. It's not for you to know, it's not for you and I to know exactly what's going to happen on Tuesday of next week. How many of you have a calendar? How many of you have it in your smartphone? Thank you, Jesus, for the invention of smartphones. So it's not for, for us to know exactly what's going to happen practically in that timeline it's really about something else. And this is what it's about. It's about when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you shall receive power. You shall have dunamis to take chronos and turn it into kairos. When you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, every moment of chronos becomes a kairos. Every moment becomes heaven on earth because the very leader of heaven, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity is heaven and he lives on the inside. So the kingdom of heaven is in you. The kingdom the kingdom of God is restored to Israel now, and we are the new Israel. Ha, ha, ha. Hallelujah. So Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle Paul writes, and he says, For the administration of the fullness of the times, which is the word kairos, the 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 administration or the dispensing, the control over the, the fullest, biggest Kairos moment in all of history. So much so that even now we base our calendar on it. We call it B.C. or A.D. So the fullness of times of Kairos to bring together all things in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things upon the earth. So what happened at the cross through, to, through the resurrection and Jesus ascending on high and pouring out his blood on the mercy seat of heaven, at that moment, heaven and earth were no longer separated. What happened at the fall of Adam in the garden is heaven and earth became separated. Adam, because he was the Lord over all the earth, he had authority over the earth, and he made a bad, wrong choice to, in his lordship over the earth to separate. When Adam separated from God, the earth separated with him because he was the Lord of the earth. Y'all with me? And that's how Lucifer became Satan, that's how he became the prince of the power of the air. That's how he became the controller of culture in the natural. He does it through man. As he did, started through Adam, he does it through man. But now the last Adam has come. 1 Corinthians 15 calls Christ the last Adam. And he's reconciled heaven and earth back together. Hallelujah. So there's no more separation between heaven and earth. You may say, well, then why are people getting sick? Why do we not see the fullness? It's because it's still under the control and the dominion of man, of little a atoms called you and me. And where we establish the kingdom, that's where heaven comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this is why Jesus said to the disciples, when you pray, pray this way. Kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because it's God's will that the two should not be separated. Jesus paid the price to bring them together. Now it is our job as the body of Christ to establish heaven in the earth. Yes. That's good news. So Jesus told the apostles when he sent them out in Matthew chapter 10. He sent out the 12. He ordained that they should be with him. And then that they should be sent out. And he said, gave them these instructions. He said, as you go, preach the message. The kingdom of heaven is near. And that word near is at hand or here. 
He didn't say, preach the kingdom of heaven is coming. He didn't say, watch for it, here are the signs. He said, declare, proclaim, the kingdom is here. Here and now. Here and now. Kingdom. See, the command of what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6 on the Mount of Olives, what he had already taught them, is that we pray this way. We command. We proclaim. We don't ask. We don't beg. It's, it's in, the, in the Greek, it is a command, and it is kingdom come. It's not like come from far off there. It's kingdom here. Kingdom now. And the power of life and death is in the tongue. He gave us the authority as mankind to establish, to represent Adam's original mandate. We call it the dominion mandate. Was to be fruitful, to multiply, and to have dominion over everything. How was he to exercise that dominion? Well, he named the animals, didn't he? He spoke over the animals. A lion, you are a lion. And when he named it, he gave them character and quality. He spoke his dominion over the natural realm. This is building on the inside of you. So he says... Declare, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near, at hand, here, now. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. What you've received from me, give away. Don't keep it for yourself, but give it to everyone you see and everywhere you go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do the stuff. Has anything changed since then? It's actually better. The only thing that's changed is Jesus died and was raised from the dead and poured out the Holy Spirit on Pentecost so that everybody would be anointed with the same Holy Spirit to do the same stuff that Jesus began back then so that we could continue to do it. He could continue to do it in and through us. Oh, this is so much fun. (laughs) Paul once again says in Ephesians 5, he says, we we shared this last week, redeem the time. He he talks about redeeming time. So let's take a look at that. Ephesians 5, 15 through 18. He says, pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time. How do we redeem the time? We talked last week about buying time back. It literally means buy the time. Buy buy the kairos, the opportunity. That word for time is not chronos, it's kairos. So like lay hold of the opportunity in the moment of the opportunity. Lay hold of it. Do what it takes to purchase that opportunity in that moment, in that day. Because the days are evil. So the days are evil until we redeem it. The day, evil is the ruler of the day until you show up and redeem that day for the kingdom of God. When you show up and begin to proclaim, no, today, hey day, today kingdom is here, hallelujah. Today, now, this day, kingdom is here, hallelujah. The sick are healed, the dead are raised, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. Today, the kingdom is here, hallelujah. So it's time to talk to your day. Tell your day. What it's there for. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So we redeem the day by understanding the Lord's will. Here's the Lord's will. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to reckless indiscretion. And that word for reckless indiscretion is similar, is uh, the same root word as riotous living, uh, that the prodigal 
gave himself to, riotous living, or wasted living. So he's really just saying, don't give yourself. How many of you, I'm not going to ask that. Don't raise your hand. I was going to ask how many of you have gotten drunk before. Don't answer. That's, but let me just use this metaphor. For those of you that have, how did you get drunk? Drinking, that was the wisest answer right there. It's the answer we were looking for. So when you drink, what do you do? You yield to the drink. And you drink a little more and you want to yield a little more. And the more you drink, the more you want to yield. And the more you want to drink. Until you've wasted that Time span. Yielding to something else having power over your thoughts, feelings, skewing your decisions, the more you yield to that, it becomes wasted time. So understand the Lord's will to redeem the time is don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So he's using something in the natural that people were familiar with to draw, to, as a metaphor, to make a picture of what it looks like to be under the influence of the Spirit. Yield yourself to the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And the word there literally means be being filled. In other words, don't just take a drink, keep drinking, keep yielding. Keep being filled. And, and not, don't even stop when you get filled up. But get filled up and let it run over onto somebody else. Be being filled. And in being filled with the Spirit, you will then begin to have an awareness of the times and seasons. You'll have an awareness of the kairos to be able to move with the Spirit to redeem the moment. Whether that moment means laying hands on this person in Walmart and, and setting them free or whether it means speaking a word of encouragement to that waitress or waiter who just served you lunch. You will redeem that moment under the Spirit's power because the Spirit knows what the moment's for. The Spirit knows what's needed in the moment. The Spirit knows the information of what that other person's going through and will share that with you so that you could bless that other person because that's what the Spirit wants to do. So we redeem the time, we don't waste the time by being filled under the influence of the Spirit. So let me just say it this way, looking for to rage your future, you have to find your future. Your future is in the Holy Ghost. All, all the future is in the Holy Ghost. If that's too Pentecostal for you, your future is in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he holds all the charts. He holds all the timelines. And he knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's in the Father's heart. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. i gotta, I got to rock and roll. So the future is in the Holy Spirit. Your future, my future is inside of, your future's inside of you. My future's inside of me. So a couple of references for that, something uh, we're familiar with, Psalms 139. Many times this is used to, rightfully so, to clarify that, 
that life begins at conception and that life is, is happening in the womb and, and that's why abortion is wrong, okay? It's used for that politically and rightfully so, but there's a lot there, lot, there's a lot in this. So let's just take a look and read beginning with verse 13. For you, David speaking, for you formed my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and I know this very well. Which works are marvelous? Yeah. Point to yourself. Say he's me. He's talking about himself and he called himself marvelous. That's not pride. That's true humility. Because he's saying I didn't make me. You made me. And marvelous are your works. <laughs> you just need a little bit of that. Marvelous. Extra. Extra. No, no. There we go. That's not. You had to be quick. I'm just saying. Marvelous are your works. And I know this. I know this very well. Do you, are, are, you, are you more familiar with your old man that may be not be so marvelous? Or are you more familiar with your new man that is marvelous? I know this very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All my days were written in your book and ordained for me before one of them came to me. Hallelujah. All my days were written in his book before any of them came into being. You know what Jesus said about his words that were written? He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So the words about your future will never pass away. It also tells me that my future, my days are in his book. That's not just some book far off in heaven that no one knows and hadn't, hadn't read. I don't I need my paper Bible. It's this book. It's the Word of God. My days are in His Word. So when I get up in the morning or before I go to bed, when I go to the Word, I'm reading about my days. I'm discovering my days in His book because his book records my days. So my days are there and my days are in here. Because they were written, they were put in me. Psalm 40, beginning with verse 5, David again is writing. He says, many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done and the plans you have for us. Now word for plans are Thoughts, imaginations, dream. You know, he's dre dreamt and he is dreaming about you and your days. None can compare to you. If I proclaim and declare them, they are more than I can count. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all I can ever ask or think are his thoughts, dreams, plans for your life. It's a hooper life. He goes on to say, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. But my ears you have opened. Some manuscripts, manuscripts use the wording, a body you have prepared for me, which is quoted in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 about Jesus that the Lord prepared a body for him. This, this whole passage is quoted there in Hebrews chapter 10. 
saying that Jesus didn't come by the old, according to the old priesthood. He came according to the Melchizedek priesthood. He came according to a new priesthood that God, he didn't have a beginning and there was no end. God prepared a body for him so that he could do the will of God, so that he could be the last Adam, so that he would have a body prepared that could be a perfect sacrifice. So God didn't want sacrifices from him Because he was the sacrifice. Okay? So he he prepared a body for him so that he could be poured into that body. That's why he is all God and all man. He is God incarnate poured into a body. Right? So he says, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am. I have come, it is written about me in the scroll, in the book. I delight to do your will, oh my God, your law is written in my heart. So here is the sacrifice, is the sacrifice is I've actually entered entered into this body and now my body is a living sacrifice because I don't use this body to serve my own agenda, my own end or my own will. I now use this body and the days of my life to serve your purpose, your your kingdom, your agenda, your will, your end, and ultimately Jesus put his body on the cross, on the altar, as a sacrifice for you and me. But Hebrews chapter 12, not Hebrews, uh, Romans chapter 12 tells me to offer your body as a living sacrifice. That we might prove the will of God. He's asking us to do the same thing Jesus did. And that is, we were poured into this body. We were poured into this tent with a purpose and agenda from heaven to display heaven on the earth. And our our purpose, our, our future is to display heaven's will, heaven's purpose while we're living in this body. Hallelujah. That's why Paul says in Corinthians that we have, we have a heavenly treasure in an earthly vessel. Our body's just jars of clay. It's an earthly vessel, but the treasure, the glory is in, the glory is in him and who he's made us to be. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're glorious. Because he made you glorious and put you in a body. I feel like I feel like I'm taking a hammer and crashing walls in our heads. He made you glorious. He made you with his glory and stuck you in a body. Whether you, whether you like that particular one or not, that's the one you're in. But you're glorious, and you're, com- you're commissioned to take care of that body, to keep it alive until you get done with his will. Hallelujah. So, he says, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but. My ears you have opened. So he's not wanting something from us. He's not asking us to give him something from ourselves. He's looking to fill us. He says, my ears you have opened. And that has, that has a dual dual meaning. It can be either way, and I think it's actually just one of those wonderfully written poetic meanings that means both. So here's one way. Your ears you have opened. The literal in the Hebrew means your, my, my ears you have bored, like taking a drill and bored them out. So it literally means, it, it means that you've opened my ears, you've bored out my ears so that I can hear. Now, I hear tell that there was a fireman that was losing their hearing in the house. 
and they're hearing, and I don't know which ear it was, but they woke up one day and they couldn't hear out of a certain ear anymore, so they went to the doctor, and that doctor, they call it in medical, did a lavage, and washed out the ear, and what came out of the ear was all kinds of material built up, wax that had captured all kinds of things from fire, including dust, soot, I heard that there was some grass in there from mowing the lawn. (laughs) All kinds of stuff had built up so thick that it had clouded over the eardrums and no sound could get through to the eardrums to register. So the doctor cleaned it out and they could hear. Now, is that true, Cliff? (laughs) (laughs) You've heard. That's it. He's heard. You're saying you're hearing now. You heard, and you, okay, he heard of a guy. I thought he was telling me he's hearing now. <laughs> we won't say who it was. But that's, a, that's really an amazing picture of what David's saying here. You have bored out my ears so that I can hear. Why is it important to hear? So that I can hear the will of God to redeem the time. So that I don't waste a day in my own agenda, but I spend my days according to what heaven's agenda and heaven's will is. And so I have to hear from heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The other, the other application and interpretation, the way that same phrase is used, is to bore the ear lobe, not the ear canal, but the ear lobe. And it's found in Deuteronomy where it says that you will bore the ear lobe, the ear, by, and put an earring into a bond slave. A person who sells themselves into slavery you will mark by putting an earring in their earlobe. You will bore their ear open. And that is the sign that they belong to another. They don't belong to themselves. They're not a free man, but they belong to another who, who gives them their will. So it's a great picture of the fact that we are sons, but we're also servants. And that as sons, we live to him and his will. We don't live to our own agenda or our own will. We belong to another. So Paul says that, that my bodies that I've been bought, don't you know that you've been bought with a price? You don't belong to yourself. Hallelujah. Therefore glorify God in your body. So we live not to ourselves, but our body is a living sacrifice to do his will. So how many of you think it's important we hear his will? Glory. Hallelujah. So how do we know his will? So we find out that his future is in the Holy Ghost, that our future is in the Holy Ghost, and our future is also inside of us. How do we discover it? I'm glad you asked. Once again, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide us by revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11 says, What my eyes, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived. So none of humanity has wrapped their brain around this. The things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. So we like to say it this way. He's not hiding things from us. He's hiding things for us. His intention is to reveal them to us. He wants us to discover that future. It's just inside the Holy Spirit, inside of our own spirit where we're connected with the Holy Spirit. It's placed there. It's hidden in there as a treasure for us to go on a treasure hunt to find out what's inside of me. How many of you like to take personality tests? And they come out with new ones all the time. 
to find out that you're exactly the same as you were in the last personality te test, just different language. Uh, here's the thing. That's, it's, not, it's not wrong. It's actually good for you to have a curiosity about yourself. He knows you better than you do, and he wants you to find out who you really are. He wants you to find out what kind of glorious stuff he placed on the inside of you so that it won't stay on the inside of you, so it can be released and be a blessing to somebody else besides just you and him. Hallelujah. He goes on to say, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. So the Holy Spirit searches the, 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 Holy Spirit searches the crevices of God's mind and thinking. No one is more intimate with the Father than the Spirit is. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? How many of you realize your spirit knows some things? Your spirit knows some things that your mind may not be aware of. But you don't lack knowledge. You just lack awareness of the knowledge you already have. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So I want you to, I want you to get this picture. And, and I, there's, you just have to have an imagination to get it. Jesus used in John 15 the picture of the vine and the branches. I'm the vine and you're the branches. You can't tell where the vine ends and the branch begins. See, your human spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit in such a way, they're so one. He that is, belongs to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are so one, it's hard to tell where one ends and the other begins. So inside of you is your spirit man who is connected to the Holy Spirit inside of you. And I just kind of picture it like this. Outside the, my backside, outside back here somewhere, the Holy Spirit is connected to the Father and Jesus and there's a there is a matrix download of the knowledge of God and the and the gifts and the equipping and the ability and the anointings of whatever I need to redeem the moment in time that I'm in there is a download from heaven that's flowing through that vine into my spirit man and that spirit man knows it and that spirit man's kind of like knocking on the door of my brain going, hello, wake up, you that are asleep, trying to get the attention of my conscious thought to be aware of what's happening on the inside of me. And many times what's happening is my conscious thought's more aware of the environment, more aware of the circumstances, more aware of what's coming against me instead of what the Holy Ghost and Jesus are doing in me. But victory is on the inside of me no matter what's coming against me. I think we sang a song about it this morning. Hallelujah. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And so the Spirit of God knows my future is already, I'm, I'm pregnant. I may not look it on the outside, but I'm pregnant on the inside. And I'm giving birth to my future every day. My future is coming forth, baby. My future is coming forth. And by the Holy Ghost. And revelation knowledge awakens my mind to what's coming out of me. So that I can cooperate. God gave you a brain. To use, not to dominate you, but to serve you. He gave you a brain, he gave me a brain, contrary to some popular belief, he gave me a brain to serve my spirit. 
And I need all of its capacity because what's in me is bigger than my brain. Hallelujah. So Jesus said a few verses later in John 16, he said, when the spirit of truth comes, he says, you need, he says, listen, I've got to go so that I can send the spirit because I'm sitting here, Paul's paraphrase. This is Jesus. You can't bear everything that I have to say to you. I want to say he got frustrated. He's Jesus. I'm sure he didn't get frustrated. But he did say, you can't bear what everything I have to say to you. So it's necessary that I go away. Why? Because if, if... I don't go away, you will not receive the Holy Spirit. If I go away, I'll send another comforter who won't just be with you like I'm with you trying to get through your five senses, your ears and your eyes and your nose, but he'll be on the inside of you. And when the Spirit is on the inside of you, he'll lead and guide you into all truth. Hallelujah. He will show you in John 16, uh, 13, John 16, 13. He says, he will show you things to come. I'm trying to tell you things to come and you just want to say, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now, Jesus? (laughs) You You are not understanding what I'm saying. So I'm going to talk to myself. I'm going to put myself on the inside of you so that I hear my words on the inside of you. And we rattle your pea brain a little bit and you can begin to get some understanding so that you can cooperate with the bigger plan. Ha, ha, ha. All right. Where is the future? It's in the Holy Ghost. Where is your future? It's in your spirit. What do we do with it? What do we do with it? Carpe diem. You knew raiding the future would sooner or or later come around to carpe diem, seize the day. Right? So three things to take home. To cooperate with your future. Number one, pray it out. Turn to your neighbor and say, pray it out. If it's in you, you don't have to pray it in. You got to pray it out. You don't pray it to you. You pray it out of you. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue... For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God... Let me just say that (laughs) sometimes we're trying to talk to people about our future more than we're talking to God. When the Holy Ghost is the only one that knows. And I'm not saying godly counsel isn't good. Godly counsel is necessary as you walk out what the Holy Ghost is showing you. But But let me just tell you this. Don't you dare go talk to an unbeliever about your future. They don't only not know about, about, they don't even know about the world. They don't know about about God's future. They don't know about your future. They may tell you how to make money, but God's got more than money for you. All right, that was extra. (laughs) For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They are utter mysteries by the Spirit. So when we pray, listen, what was the first thing that happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the 120 in the upper room? Tongues of fire descended on them and they did what? They spoke in other tongues. Tongues, languages that their mind did not understand and they magnified God. They poured out into the street. Peter stood up and preached and 3,000 got saved. So this is Pentecost and so we need to hear and we need to know that when that there is a, a language that is by the Holy Spirit, they spoke as the Spirit gave utterance. They had to do the speaking but the utterance, the language came from the Holy Spirit that that had just been poured into them. Poured out from heaven, poured into these vessels. Right? And so when, when you speak, 
speak in that language. You are magnifying God and you're speaking mysteries to God. Why are they mysteries? Because you don't know them. They're not intended to stay a mystery. It's the process in which the Holy Spirit reveals to you what your future is. Let's keep reading. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a, in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. So there is this rhythm of prayer and worship and singing and praying. I pray in the Holy Ghost. I pray in a language my mind doesn't understand, but then I shift and I start praying into a, out of a language my mind does not understand, and the Holy Spirit through my spirit begins to to interpret to my understanding the very things that the Holy Spirit was praying for through me when I didn't understand what I was praying. Does that make sense? Well, it only makes sense to those that do it because it makes no sense otherwise. But let me tell you what makes sense. Oral Roberts said, used to say this when we were, when we were there in, in school. He said, this, many, he said, many people ask me, how did, you, how did you build a university for God? And he said, I had no clue. He said, I didn't even have a high school education. And he built a university that gives postgraduate degrees, PhDs, DMINs, MDs, came out of him by the Holy Ghost. He said, people ask me all the time, how did you do that? He said, this is all I know. Father, you said to me, build you a university. I don't know how to do that, so I'm expecting you to reveal it. Okay, South Tulsa, Lewis Avenue, okay? Let me just go there. He goes there, finds a piece of property that he gets out of the car, fills the letter of the Holy Ghost, starts walking that piece of property, and he just goes literally around the piece of property. Thank you, Father, this is your university. This is not, you called me to build this university. It's not my university. It's your university. You've, you're calling to me to raise, that you, to raise up students to hear your voice, that they can go where my, your light seen dim, where your, where your voice is heard small, and their works will exceed my works. So, Father, we need more work, so uh, we're building this university. Okay, okay. Yes, uh, I'm praying, you know, okay. Gather a group of leaders, okay, that, that know more than I do. I think I can do that. Lead me to who they are. And he got on the phone. He began to call leaders, began to gather leaders around him that, knew, that, that had all the degrees and said, and he shared the vision with them. And it just began one step at a time. He said, I would pray seven hours a day in the spirit. Then I'd pray, Lord, help me understand what I'm praying. And I'd pray in the understanding. And then I'd have the knowledge to know what to do. And then I'd pray in the spirit some more. And then I'd say, Lord, help me understand what the Holy Ghost is praying through me and then I pray in the understanding and then I understood what to do and I understood who to call and out of that praying in the Holy Ghost seven hours a day came a university that five to six thousand students a year since 1966 graduate to take the gospel into every man's world It came out of praying in the Spirit and praying in the understanding. When we don't know what to do, Romans chapter 8 says the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, making intercession in us, through us. It says in verse 26 and 27, let me just read it in the same way the Holy Spirit helps us. In our weaknesses, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. 
And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. If you don't know the will of God in a situation, go to the Word and pray in the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit absolutely knows the exact will of God. Somebody say amen. Amen. So number one, pray it out. Number two, call it out. Our worship team, I'm calling you out now to come. Pray it out, call it out. Romans chapter 4. We shared this last week. Therefore, the promise comes by faith. So that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all. So the promise comes by faith that it might be by grace. You can't earn it. It's a free gift. You can only receive it by faith. And it's given, guaranteed, given to all. Peter stood up and said, this gift which you see and hear... This promise of the Father is to you, your children, your children's children, and to all, to all those that are afar off. He is our Father in the sight of God in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. He calls things into being things that were not. He calls into being things that were not. They become when you call them. They were not until you said it. When you say it, they are it. They don't become it when you see it. They become it when you say it. Our profession, our confession, our proclamation creates the reality. It's called prophecy. Prophecy creates the reality of what was not there before. It was pre-existent in the, in the Holy Spirit, but when man puts words to it, because God gave authority to Adam, when man puts words to it, it becomes reality. Number one, pray it out. Number two, call it out. Number three, speak it out. Yeah, think there's a theme there. All three have to do with our mouth, don't they? Speak it out. Mark 11, 22 and 24. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have, past tense, received it, and it will be yours. He's time traveling on us. Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. He that believes that what they say will happen. You pray it out of your innermost being. You call it out into the natural. And then you start speaking to it. I think there's a divine order there to pray it out, call it out, and then speak to it. What you've prayed out, begin to talk to. Future, you belong to me. Healing, you're mine. I don't have a condition, I have a healing. Somebody stand up with me today. Mm. 
Can we make some declarations? Can we draw from the well within the future that he imagines, that he dreams for our life? So would you just declare this with me? I declare today, my mouth gives voice to my spirit and to the Holy Spirit within my spirit. So I declare today, from heaven to the earth, the promises of God, the purposes of God, I declare my future is good. His thoughts, His plans, His future for me is within me. And I call it forth in Jesus' name. I declare today, I have a good future. I have a blessed future. My days are blessed. They're not evil days. They're blessed days. They are the days of heaven on earth. All of my days are crammed full of heaven, of heaven's will, of God's goodness, of God's promises, of God's presence. I declare today, over this day, you belong to me and I fill you up with the promise of God with the goodness of God. Today is a good day. Today is a great day. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will be glad in it because it's a great day. Good things are happening to me. Good things are waiting for me in my day to day. Kairos moments, divine appointments, divine connections are waiting for my arrival. So I call them forth out of the spirit into the natural. Today, in Jesus' name, I have a great future. I'm a world changer. I'm a history maker. I'm a blessed person. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. I'm blessed going forth. I give to seven and to eight. I give to others. Others are refreshed because of the blessing that I am filled with from heaven's resources. I'm a blessed person and I overflow to those around me. I lay hands on the sick and they recover. I declare today, it's a good day. It's a great day. This is my day to shine. It's my day to release the glory of God through my life. Today's a good day. Today's a great day. I will rejoice. I will be glad in this day. Ha, ha, ha. He, he. Ho, ho, ho. Ha, ha, ha. Somebody begin to praise God. Somebody lift your whole voice. Lift your heart. Hallelujah. 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 Great things are happening. Hallelujah. Our happy prayer partners are coming down to the front quickly. It's a great day. He is a healer today. Hallelujah, he healed us 2,000 years ago and he's healing today. So one thing I I felt like the Holy Spirit showed me was a right arm that is weak and trembly. You just feel real weak, like it trembles a little bit on the right side. If that's you, I just want you to make your way down towards one of these Abbey Prayer Partners. We're gonna lay hands on you, pray for you. Anybody with a right arm, shoulder, that makes you just feel weak, like it's, you don't want to lean on it. Hallelujah. Welcome home, Diane. Come on down. Hallelujah. 
Give her a big hand. She just got back from England. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Prayer partners, y'all have anything? Randy? Right shoulder? Right shoulder. Awesome. You're getting prayer. Gotcha. Hallelujah. Butch says, Perry Ann, go pray for him. For him, because he got healed. Hallelujah. How many know Jesus is the healer? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good. say Billy and Diane your grandchildren have a great future they are the heritage of the Lord and they have a great future their future is great and filled with God filled with divine appointments filled with Holy Ghost encounters I just see God sending people to your grandchildren with supernatural power and proclamation of the goodness of God. The heritage of the Lord. They are the redeemed of the Lord. And they will fulfill their purpose in the earth. And your death, your legacy will be carried on to a thousand generations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'll tell you what, before we go today, just turn to somebody and just put your hand on their shoulder and just speak blessing over them. Just release the presence of God over them. Just bless them. Tell them their future is great. Release the anointing and the presence of God in them. Stir up the gift that's in them. Hallelujah. And if you want agreement beyond that, our prayer partners are available. If you're a first-time guest with us today or just new among us and you haven't had a chance to meet the leadership team, we'd love to greet you and give you a gift before you go today. Hallelujah. Just bless somebody before you go today and you can be dismissed. Thank you, team.